You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. And we're opening today's show with a quote from the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, which you're probably all familiar with. Then we're going to run with it. But first, a heads up that I had blood drawn today for lots of labs, and both my wife and I got shots for uh, RSV. Yep. And so if I'm a little lightheaded or thick of tongue, <laughs> please excuse me for my... You'll be uh, fine. <laughs> uh, I, I know, but I want an excuse out there in advance. Should oh, I speak okay. real bad? You're, you oh. are pre-excusing yourself for any flaws in this episode. Blame it on the terrible pain I'm in and the terrible, <laughs> terrible reaction I'm having to a uh, common everyday uh, vaccine. He's going to be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. All right. So John Kenneth Galbraith, the quote is, the modern conservative is engaged in one of man's oldest exercises in moral philosophy. That is the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness, which was cut down from this original quote, which I just love. Quote, the modern conservative is not even especially modern. He is engaged, on the contrary, in one of man's oldest, best financed, most applauded, and on the whole, least successful exercises in moral philosophy. That is the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness. It is an exercise which always involves a certain number of internal contradictions and even a few absurdities. The conspicuously wealthy turn up urging the character building value of privation for the poor. Yes, good for their character, good for their souls. <laughs> the man who has struck it rich in minerals, oil, or other bounties of nature is found explaining the debilitating effect of unearned income from the state. The corporate executive, who is a superlative success as an organization man, weighs in on the evils of bureaucracy. Federal aid to education is feared by those who live in suburbs that could easily forego this danger and by people whose children are in public schools and often people who move to specific suburbs for the public schools. Yeah, we're surrounded by them. Oh, gosh. Socialized medicine is condemned by men emerging from Walter Reed Hospital. Social Security is viewed with alarm by those who have the comfortable cushion of an inherited income. Those who are immediately threatened by public efforts to meet their needs, whether widows, small farmers, hospitalized veterans, or the unemployed, are almost always oblivious to the danger, unquote. Yeah. To which I would add, oblivious because, you know, aid to white people is always invisible. Right. It, you never see it. Until it's gone. And it's then your you entitlement. Know. You paid into it all your life. Uh, you've earned it, et cetera, et cetera. It's those people who are the undeserving poor. Right. The, the, until your benefits go away, everything's fine. And when they do, it's the undeserving poor who've stolen them from you right. somehow. Now, the most depressing part of this incredibly insightful quote is that it's from 60 years ago. Yeah. Six, oh, six decades ago. It's from Galbraith's Wealth and Poverty speech, which he delivered to the National Policy Committee on Pockets of Poverty in December of 1963. And everything he warned about is not only still true, but it has all gotten exponentially worse and exponentially stupider. 60 years ago, conservatives had to dress up their greed in the academic language of economics, and they had to speak piously about throwing off the shackles of government. But not so much anymore. Because 60 years of conservative propaganda has done its work. There's a quote by William Burroughs I've used before to describe what has happened to the right over the decades, comparing it to heroin addiction. Quote, the heroin merchant does not sell his product to the consumer. He sells the consumer to his product. 
He does not improve and simplify his merchandise. He degrades and simplifies the client, unquote. And that's what decades of conservative propaganda has accomplished. It's made the average Republican stupider and stupider, angrier and angrier, to the point where the conservative agenda doesn't have to disguise itself with laugher curves and the kind of intricate bullshitting that used to be the weekly standards stock in trade. Once the average Republican voter was, whether you call it brainwashed or stupid or repetitive enough and angry enough, once he has been sufficiently degraded and simplified, all any Republican had to do was promise that whatever nonsense they were proposing would own the libs. Gotta that's the, the goal. Libs. Own the libs. Yeah. Make liberals cry. That's all that's required now. So while Galbraith's original observation is 100% true, it's no longer sufficient to explain what's going on on the right. And you can see that in the speaker's race. Today, right this very no, minute. No, if you turn nobody on knows what anybody stands for. Because they stand for nothing. They stand, they stand for, for absolutely nothing. nothing. No, except, except owning the libs. The well, making sure thing, liberals are mad by the choice. Yeah. The one thing they cannot do, the one thing they would rather take a bite out of a, a live wire than do is to make any compromise with the Democrats. Yeah. That's off the table. And then, of course, you blame the Democrats for not, you know, when, when up their things mess. go wrong, you blame right. the Democrats. Right. Mm -hmm. So while Galbraith's original observation is 100% true, it's no longer sufficient to explain what's going on on the right. For that, we need a new dimension to Galbraith to change it from conservatism is the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness to conservatism is now a machine that generates moral justifications for whatever the right wants to believe at any given moment. Now it's about reverse engineering excuses for whatever crazy thing they wanted to do anyway. They hated Bill Clinton because he was a Democrat and he was smarter than they were. So Clinton became a corrupt, murdering, drug-dealing rapist who urgently needed to be impeached over, let's find something quick. Yeah, they, they decided very clearly to take down Clinton before he was sworn into office. Right. They, and they we're going to subpoena his, his wife's Christmas card list. Right. Everything. Uh, Anything. Everything. Everything's going to be turned upside down in search of something. And when the special first special prosecutor says no, Whitewater is just a bad land deal that lost the Clintons' money. The House Republicans said, well, that's not good enough. We need a new special prosecutor. Yeah, yeah. And, and his just... job is to find something. His mandate is to not to investigate, but to find something Keep on digging. which we can hang Bill Clinton. Just dig and dig and dig and dig. And you know what? They hated Barack Obama even more than Bill yeah. Clinton. You remember during the first few uh, weeks of the Obama administration or when Republicans were looking back going, why can't Obama be more like Clinton? Clinton was such a cooperator. He was so cooperative. He was so compliant. He he knew about bipartisanship. All these people that shit all over Clinton because the previous guy has to be better than the guy we have now. So mm -hmm. Obama became the devil. They hated him because, let's face it, he was black and he was a Democrat and he was smarter than they were. And this was during the time when they had been completely humiliated by their fealty to George W. Bush. So Obama became, in their minds, a Kenyan Muslim sleeper cell who wanted to murder their sated white grandmothers, thus justifying their hatred and the Republican program of blocking and sabotaging anything Obama tried to accomplish. And they hate Joe Biden. You know why, Blue Gal? Because he stole the election. He stole, he stole the, the election, election drift glass. And, and something, something old, doddering, weak, corrupt, China, China. And he has weaponized every arm of law enforcement from the sheriff of Mayberry to the Department of Justice to go after his political enemies. And also, don't know if you heard, Blue Gal, Hunter Biden's laptop. Oh, so, and, and there's a check to his brother, don't forget. Oh, I heard. When, I heard he, wasn't, when he wasn't vice president, when Trump mm -hmm. was president and writing checks to Michael Cohen to pay off hookers. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> porn what, stars. What, what more of a smoking gun do you need than a family <laughs> loan being paid off by your brother? Paid back, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously Joe Biden urgently needs to be impeached over something. Something. Figure He's got to be impeached immediately. Yes. And, and what's so much fun is you can watch them just flailing around going, I need to find an excuse to do what I want to do anyway. I need to find mm -hmm. some fucking reason out of, and they, they make them up and they fall apart. You know, that we have this, we have these informers, we have whistleblowers. Where are they? Well, they ran away. 
Oh, okay. What else you got? Well, we found this check. And it goes on and on because they are searching for a justification to do whatever they want. You see, Republicans' excuses for behaving monstrously, getting louder and louder and stupider and stupider over time as the Republican base got louder and stupider. They didn't need to be smart anymore. They didn't need the weekly standard to explain things in big words because the base got dumb and angry and willing to listen to anybody. So today, you and I, Blue Gal, we're going to go back to May of 1976 to one of the breakthrough moments when this kind of backwards thinking was formally adopted as a Republican doctrine to what was called a competitive analysis exercise, which was set up by the CIA and called Team B. Yeah, now follow us on this. Mm -hmm. Team B was commissioned by the CIA to analyze threats the Soviet Union posed to the security of the United States. Mm -hmm. It was created in part due to a 1974 publication by Albert Wolstetter, who accused the CIA of chronically underestimating Soviet military capability. President Gerald Ford began the Team B project in May of 1976 by inviting a group of so-called outside experts to evaluate classified intelligence on the Soviet Union. This is from an August 18, 2004 article in American Progress by Lawrence Korb. You will notice some familiar names here. Mm -hmm. Quote, on May 6, 1976, then Director of Central Intelligence George H.W. Bush created a Team B to assess a 1975 National Intelligence Estimate by his agency on Soviet strategic objectives. Because the NIE did not endorse a worst-case scenario of Soviet capabilities, outsiders demanded access to the same classified intelligence used by the CIA in preparing the report, so they could come to their own conclusions. So they wanted to break into classified documents. Mm -hmm. The concept of a Team B competitive analysis had been opposed by William Colby, a career professional, and Bush's predecessor as CIA director. He didn't want people looking at their classified information. That's really weird, don't you think, Drew It's so strange. Hmm. It's so odd. But Bush, George H.W. Bush, who, reminder, is director of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And who's going to go on to a higher office someday, Blue Gal. Someday, I, right. And maybe his kids will, too. And he's under pressure from President Ford, who was facing a strong challenge from right-wing Republicans. He was being primaried in 1976. I mean, you, you can't make this up. History just key is, is reruns. It is. All right. So he's facing a strong challenge from right-wing Republicans in that year's primary. And Rumsfeld's Pentagon, which was trying to undermine support for Kissinger's detente with the Soviet Union, they caved. They said, okay. Fine. We're Bring going to let there be a team B. They're going to have access to classified information about the Soviet Union right. so that they can analyze it from the standpoint of, did we get it right? Right. Are, are we right about Soviet military capability and their ability to execute plans? All right. Now, now just FYI, there's nothing wrong with having a second set of eyes and like right. the problem. You and I do it all the time. Right. I mean, you know, you correct my errors. I was a programmer for years, and it was always great at three in the morning when you're fixing a problem to have somebody right. else look over sure. and make sure you're not screwing everything up. So theoretically, this is not a bad idea, but, but, but that was not the intention of this group. No, the outside experts, and these guys got security clearance to look at this stuff on mm -hmm. Team B, were led by Harvard professor Richard Pipes and included such well-known hawks as Paul Nitze, Am I saying that right, Nitzi? I think that's right. Okay. William Van Cleve and Paul Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz, oh my yeah. God. Paul yeah. Wolfowitz. Not surprisingly, Team B concluded that the intelligence specialist had badly underestimated the threat of the Soviet Union because. And then comes the most important sentence in the whole article. <laughs> They underestimated the threat because they they relied too heavily on hard data, you know, <laughs> actual data, instead of extrapolating the Soviets' intentions from ideology. According to some Team B members, 
quote, the principal threat to our nation, to world peace, and to the cause of human freedom was the Soviet drive for dominance based on an unparalleled military buildup, unquote. They had to believe the Soviet was Soviet Union was doing this to justify their own preconceptions about what the Soviet Union was doing. Mm-hmm. Well, and their own stock portfolios as well. I mean, yeah. all of this is together. So right here in the spring of 1976, you have the future architects of George W. Bush's Iraq debacle. Mm -hmm. Men like Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pipes, Don Rumsfeld, signing on to a political doctrine that expressly said that whatever your ideology led you, wherever it led you, whatever you believed your opponent was up to, trumps any actual data that proved the opposite. We believe that Iraq, we believe we, that Saddam Hussein has weapons. of We believe it so hard. It must be true. Right. And don't forget that before he became Gerald Ford's secretary of defense, Don Rumsfeld was Gerald Ford's chief of staff. And after he got moved over to the defense department, who took his place as Ford's chief of staff? Dick Cheney. <laughs> Enter Dick Cheney. Enter yep. Dick Cheney. The American Progress article continues, quote, although the Team B report contained little factual data, <laughs> it was enthusiastically received by conservative groups, such as the Committee on the Present Danger, whose members included Ronald Reagan and the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. But the report turned out to be grossly inaccurate. Go figure. Yeah. For example, it said that the Soviets would have 500 intercontinental backfire bombers capable of striking the United States by 1984. In reality, they had less than half of that, 235. Mm -hmm. Unquote. Now, now, here's the magic thing about Team B thinking. Not only can existing threats be wildly exaggerated to fit the narrative the hardliners want to sell, but completely imaginary threats can be conjured out of thin air. And the absence of evidence, this is the fun part, the absence of evidence that those threats are real is magically transformed into proof of how advanced and secretive the enemy really is. Ooh. Yep, quote, and this is uh, th conjure in your mind the hunt for Red October yeah. when you hear this. Yeah. Team B also claimed that the Soviets were working on an anti-acoustic submarine, though they failed to find any evidence of one. The Hawks explained away this lack of evidence by stating that, quote, the submarine may have already been deployed because it appeared to have evaded detection. Unquote. They couldn't see it. They had no evidence of it. And that was proof that it was out there and it was very dangerous. Team B thinking was such a useful magic wishing stone that even after reports showed that all such estimates had been completely wrong, Republicans kept right on using it to invent whatever imaginary menace they needed to justify their military budgets. So for the next three decades, Republicans would assert again and again the existence of imaginary threats or the presence of imaginary alliances to justify skyrocketing spending on defense. They asserted that the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, was receiving training and backing from the Soviet Union, which it was not. They even invented a completely fictitious linkage between the assassination of Pope John Paul II and the Soviet Union. The, the assassination attempt on John Paul II. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's, Russia's behind it. Soviet's behind it. You know this. <laughs> quote, quote, in the first Bush administration, the CIA claimed that Soviet spending on weapons had started declining in 1988, and the number of Soviet strategic launchers was staying the same or declining. Then Secretary of Defense Dick fucking Cheney argued publicly that the Soviet Union's efforts to modernize its strategic nuclear weapons were robust and continuous. Moreover, Cheney asserted that there was absolutely no evidence that Gorbachev's ascension had altered Soviet strategic planning, unquote. Remember, this is Dick Cheney asserting with no evidence at all a non-existent threat which required immediate money and action. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even when Team B hardliners were out of power during the Clinton administration, Republicans used Newt Gingrich and the Republican House to continue manufacturing non-existent threats. So, here comes Christmas. Uh -huh. On 9-11, Team B veterans Paul Wolfowitz, Douglas Fifth, Fife? Yes, Fife. Douglas Fife. 
Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney knew their golden opportunity had arrived. And you saw that that day in the Oval yep. Office. We have to yep. find a way to connect this to Iraq. Now, many of you know this history already, I and mean, a lot of people have covered it. Here's a brief review. Cheney and his gang exploited the shock and patriotism of a grieving nation to transform the war they got, an attack by Saudis launched from Afghanistan, into the war they wanted, the conquest and occupation of oil-rich Iraq. And they did it by lying and by manufacturing evidence, by pretending to have secret proof of weapons and alliances which did not exist, and by terrorizing an already terrified nation and our compliant media into believing that if they did not comply with Dick Cheney's wishes, if the Bush administration wasn't granted virtually unchecked power, and if voters didn't return George Bush to the White House in 2004, another, even worse, terrorist attack was probably inevitable. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a mushroom cloud, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And don't right forget now. George W. Bush going around the country and saying, Al-Qaeda Saddam, Al-Qaeda Saddam, Al-Qaeda Saddam. Yep. It was brainwashing. A whole lot of people volunteered to join the military to go to Baghdad. Right. that's where the terrorists were. Right. And Dick Cheney said, you know, in advance of the 2004 election, he basically, if you vote wrong, you know, expect another attack. Right. And it, it right. was it was ugly. It was brutal and it was ugly and it, it never stopped. They never stopped doing it. Conservatives had at last found their superior moral justification for doing whatever the hell they wanted. Yep. And if you were on the left, if you questioned or opposed the war or attended a rally or spoke out, you were hated like you had never been hated before. You were a terrorist-loving, America-hating commie libtard, and that was being nice about it. Mm-hmm. Remember the Dixie Chicks and how their career was destroyed? Mm -hmm. By simply saying they were sorry George Bush was born in Texas? Yep. Twelve words. That's all he said. Mm -hmm. And it was the end of airplay on country music radio. Gone. Flat. Shut up and sing. And and it wasn't even sing. Shut up. Shut up. Yep, you're done. Then came the death threats. The the, uh, threatened to attack them at their concerts. They should be strapped to a bomb and dropped on Iraq. And the people who were making those threats felt perfectly comfortable. They felt patriotic. They felt like... We know in George Bush was like, you're either with us or with the terrorists. Those are your two choices. You either back George Bush 100% or you sided with the terrorists. And those of us who thought George Bush was making a huge fucking mistake and was lying us into the wrong war and fucking it up, we took a a raft of shit during that period like you would not believe. If you weren't there, it's hard to explain. It it came awfully close to the blacklists of the McCarthy era. Mm -hmm. That's how Mm -hmm. bad things got. And then the whole infrastructure of lies that Bush used to sell the war began to fall apart. Oh, no. There was no WMD. And Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. The Iraq insurgency that was killing American soldiers had been created by the screwed up, misbegotten policies of the Bush administration. The U.S. military had allowed the real bad guy, Osama bin Laden, the actual architect of 9-11, to slip through their fingers and escape. Billions of taxpayer dollars were vanishing into the sands of Iraq, and every day was Christmas for corrupt defense contractors, including the company Dick Cheney had run before he conned George Bush into making him vice president. Now, a debacle the size of Iraq, plus the debacle of Hurricane Katrina, plus the collapse of the global economy on George Bush's watch, plus, 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 should have been the end of the Republican Party forever. The humiliation of Republican voters who'd been committed to George Bush, body and soul. I still have the scars on my chest where they poked me. My friends poked me. Conservative friends poked me in the chest going, how dare you question George Bush? Who, you know, forgot like two years later they'd ever heard of the guy. That should have shut them up forever. The systemic failure of Republican elected officials should have led Democrats into super majorities in Congress for the next 50 years. Absolutely. But none of that happened. Instead, this was the moment when the conservative Team B foreign policy mentality came home to roost domestically. And the justifications for Republicans believing things which were patently untrue started multiplying like mosquitoes in stagnant water. 
suddenly none of this was the fault of Republican voters because there were no Republican voters to be found anywhere. There were only independent Tea Partiers who swore they never heard of George Bush, who were completely apolitical until, you know, the Kenyan usurper somehow, for some reason, uh, with the heat of a thousand suns, taxes, deficits, uh, taxed enough already, and uh, we hate Democrats and we love freedom. Mm -hmm. And suddenly all the bad news about the Republican Party was suspect because something, something George Soros and George Bush who? Our leaders are Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh. Mega dittos. Mega dittos, blue gal. Mega dittos. Yep. We on the left shouted about this as loud as we could, but as we watched, the entire Bush administration was bulldozed down the memory hole, not only by the right, but by cable news. Yep. Paved over by the complicit mainstream media who saw this new political movement, the Tea Party, as, you know, both sides. Oh, look at this. Here's this, this new brand- movement. And the story was, hey, what about this terrible deficit, Mm -hmm. which (laughs) the Bush tax cuts had created? Yeah. And had burned through the Clinton surplus to create. Surplus, yes. And what about that communist murder plot against grandma called Obamacare? Yeah. What about that? Huh? Huh? And Obama phones, you know, that's a waste of the taxpayer's money. Also, Mm -hmm. he wore a tan suit. Yep. Tan suit. And where's his flag pin? We all need a flag pin. Solyndra. And was Obama even born here, Drift Glass? You know, so I, there's this this businessman named Donald Trump who used his own money and says he sent people to Hawaii. And they were finding things that will blow your mind. You wouldn't believe what they found, Drift Glass. You won't believe what they're finding out about Barack Obama. There's so many things. <laughs> so many things. Oh, my God. Hold on. And where are his transcripts? Where are his transcripts? Huh? Huh? Would he even go to college? Is he even a human being? Is he from a different planet? And... The Republican base got behind this fire hose of absolutely ridiculous lies because the alternative was too horrible to contemplate, which is they've been fucking wrong about everything their entire life. They'd have to take ownership of being complete idiots and and unpatriotic and destroying America and being wrong, 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 wrong. But worse than that, liberals were right, and they would rather take their own heads off with a melon baller than admit liberals are right about anything because they'd already learned that nothing they said or did would carry any consequences for them. And because there was a giant conservative media machine that was perfectly happy to feed them the lies that they wished, whatever lies they wanted, Fox News and hate radio would serve up. And they loved, loved hating Obama. They loved it when he cried after a mass shooting. Every tragedy was to them just an opportunity to own the libs, to stick it to the libs. And every time another one of their insane conspiracy theories fell apart, They reacted like Team B reacted when faced with the fact there was no evidence that the Soviets were working on an anti-acoustic submarine. The absence of evidence to these people only proved how deep the liberal conspiracy went. Like Team B, Republicans gave up on the idea of relying on actual data completely to justify their deranged beliefs and instead began wildly extrapolating what our sinister liberal agenda must be based on the lies They had already been told about our ideology over and over and over again for decades by hate radio. And what do Republicans believe that we deep state fake news liberals are secretly up to? Well, I suppose you and I, Blue Gal, could take a look at the titles of just a few of the hundreds and hundreds of books that leaders and influencers on the right have been cranking out for decades. Hardcover books, Drift Glass, that go on your shelf and show that you're a true conservative. That's right. So there's... Adios America, the left's plan to turn our country into a third world hellhole. That's by Ann Coulter. And there's Slander, Liberal Lies About the American Right by Ann Coulter. And then there's Mugged, Racial Demagoguery from the 70s to Obama, mostly focused on Obama, Mm -hmm. by Ann Coulter. There's also Demonic, How the Liberal Mob is Endangering America by Ann Coulter. Did she write these in her sleep? Like just I think typed she, out. I think what? she might have had a lot of uh, things to help her keep awake for like weeks oh, at yeah. a time to just yeah. crank this shit out because this was yeah. her whole living. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Godless: The Church of Liberalism by Ann Coulter. And The Democrat Party Hates America by Mark Levin. Now that's a relatively new book. Yes, it is. Also, American Marxism 
which is about the Democratic Party, sure. by Mark Levin. And deliver us from evil, defeating terrorism, despotism, and liberalism by none other than Sean Hannity. Persecution, how liberals are waging war against Christianity by Rush Limbaugh's idiot brother, David. David and, Limbaugh, you know, and, he's the theologian of the family. Yeah, he's he's the quiet, smart one in the corner. He didn't like attracting attention to himself. He was more of a book guy than a radio <laughs> guy. Um, and Crimes Against Liberty, an indictment of President Barack Obama, also by David Limbaugh. And The Great Destroyer, <laughs> Barack Obama's War on the Republic by David Limbaugh. He's got and, a lot of books out there. He, they're, they're, well, they, they're pooping them out like a Pez dispenser. Mm -hmm. And Liberalism is a Mental Disorder by Michael Savage. The Enemy Within, Saving America from the Liberal Assault on Our Churches, Schools, and, and this is adorable, Military, by Michael Savage. And the next one's a favorite of mine because this is, you know, this is the gold standard, according to David Brooks, of the coming conservative renaissance. It is, of course. <laughs> Intellectual renaissance of the conservative movement. Oh, yeah. He's going to, he's in the vanguard of that. And he's also, uh, he quit Fox News finally over principle. Now he works uh, at CNN. And it is, of course, liberal fascism, the secret history of the American left from Mussolini to the politics of change by Jonah Goldberg. The roots of Obama's rage. You know, angry black man. A very angry black man. By Dinesh D'Souza. Yeah. Talk about an angry black man. Uh, and Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences Americans by Ben Shapiro, who has his own podcast, his own radio show, his own television network, and millions and millions and millions of people on Facebook. Uh, and yet he is silenced by you He's and I. He's been silenced by the, left. by the left's culture of fear and intimidation. <laughs> yep. You know who's been silenced? A lot of House speaker candidates. <laughs> By the rights, fear, and intimidation. I'm not mm -hmm. kidding. Yep. Uh, finally, Woke Incorporated, Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam by Vivek Ramaswamy. Remember him? Yeah. yeah. Ever heard of him? Ever heard of him? He's running for president. There are hundreds and hundreds of books like this, some of which are kind of obscure, of course, but thanks to conservative bulk buying scams, because the right has unlimited money. Many of them became New York Times bestsellers and made their authors a lot of money and gave them a very high media profile. They were part of the cycle of escalating conservative hysteria that is the engine of the Republican Party. The fact that they were books gave this garbage a patina of respectability that got the authors invited on to various media platforms. For example, Ramesh Panuru was just another minor American Enterprise Institute weasel until he wrote The Party of Death, The Democrats, The Media, The Courts, and The Disregard for Human Life. Scary. So scary. Then suddenly he was an in-demand deep thinker who had since faded back into the woodwork, but to this day still remains on the Rolodex of both, both Ben Shapiro and Joe freaking Scarborough. I remember being in the office of my kids' elementary school back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And a mother walking in and chatting with the secretary and saying, have you read the new book by, and it was, you know, Mark Levin. Right. Oh, it's. And so she good. thought she was being an intellectual. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bringing I, this up. I know people, pillars of this community who yeah. have on their shelves the, um, the Christopher Ruddy book about the murder of Vince Foster. Remember Vince that Vince Foster, yeah. yeah. And, and be still believe it. Still absolutely, no, absolutely. believe Vince Foster was murdered. Yeah. That's... Swear on their children. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And because this is no fair remembering stuff, we also remember that even after far right-wing lunatic Michelle Malkin had written garbage like, quote, unhinged, exposing liberals gone wild in 2005, and, and I'm not making this book up, Right. she wrote, in defense of internment, the case for racial profiling in World War II and the War on Terror. Mm -hmm. And after writing that book, she was still invited on to ABC's premier Sunday morning public interest program this week with George Stephanopoulos to hype her other book, her other other book. <laughs> And this book was called Culture of Corruption, Obama and His Team of Tax Cheats, Crooks, and Cronies. 
which was published mere months after Barack Obama was inaugurated. And and you've noticed. Yeah. When, when did she, she sign have... the contract to write that book? Yeah. When did she start writing it that it yeah. was in publication that just a few was, months after you know... he's inaugurated? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Once ravings and slander have been turned into a respectable book, those ravings and slanders were repeated endlessly on hate radio and Fox News because you always want to have someone on that just has a brand new book out. Mm -hmm. where like stone soup, even more ingredients can be added. Mm -hmm. All of which is then recycled into the next iteration of Republican madness and panic. Mm -hmm. Now, but Drift Class and Blue Gal, you might ask, aren't these examples all from deeply committed lunatics and grifters who crank out hysterical lies for a living? Yes, they are. What about those mythical, reasonable, constitution-loving conservatives about whom we hear so very much these days in all the newspapers, the ones who stand up to the excesses of their own party, like, you know, say, Liz Cheney. What does hero of the resistance Liz Cheney think of Democrats? Well, as a matter of fact, just a few years back, when she was still an unstinting supporter of then-President Donald Trump, this is what Dick Cheney's daughter had to say about Democrats. Uh, but there's something in particular that I want to speak to this morning and that my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Wagner, wants to speak to. Uh, and that's to make sure that every American understands what today's Democrat Party stands for with respect to babies and with respect to the murder of babies. The idea that, that we have to say today to mothers all across this country uh, that we've got to describe what the Democrats are doing is really horrific. And, and I want to ask mothers across this country to join with us to make sure that we don't see our maternity wards turned into killing fields, which is what the Democrats would do if we don't stop this. She was in the Rose Garden the day that the House voted to take away my health insurance. Uh -huh. The beer party that Trump held in the Rose Garden. She was there cheering it on. Yep. Yep. So... For decades, if you were an uncommitted, both sides do it mope, or even if you were a conservative but were part of the respectable media that put a high gloss on terrible conservative ideas, I'm looking at you, Brit Hume, it was easy to ignore what an absolutely unhinged, liberal-hating, free-fire zone conservative media had become. David Brooks on Meet the President. I don't know what Rush Limbaugh says, you know, on PBS saying, I don't yeah. know what I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. You know, I what? don't I don't listen to that. Mm -hmm. To all of those folks and to the entire mainstream media, all of that was just a bunch of noise from far away because it wasn't directed at them. Right. Harmless. Which is what happened to Kathleen Parker, who had been one of the Washington Post conservative op-ed writers for decades and was in 2008 a frequent guest on Meet the Press and the Chris Matthews show as the conservative. Mhm. Mm very respectable. She blithely ignored the entire conservative media ecosystem as a kind of raucous, embarrassing sideshow. And then in 2008, she dared to write a column about Sarah Palin's qualifications to be vice president or lack thereof, mm -hmm. and was shocked to find her party is full of vicious, threatening, delusional freaks. <laughs> yep. Here's an excerpt from her subsequent column. Quote, Allow me to introduce myself. I am a traitor and an idiot. Also, my mother should have aborted me and left me in a dumpster. But since she didn't, I should off myself. After 20 years of column writing, I'm familiar with angry mail. But the past few days have produced responses of a different order. Not just angry, but vicious and threatening. Oh, really? Really? Did huh. you ever been on the phone with the Dixie Chicks? Yeah. Did you? Uh, yeah. Listen to that and then listen to what's been going on with Republican House members, yeah. way right cons conservative House members who, who were all for people to begin with, but who had some doubts about Jim Jordan right. getting credible and, threats. And have an 82 percent from the American Conservative Union, yeah. the but, same as Marjorie Taylor Greene does. But you stepped off the res for one second and you get you get credible death threats. threats and your wife gets death threats. Yeah. So here is yeah. what. Your humble Scrivener, me, Drift Class, wrote in response to Kathleen Parker's article. And remember, I was writing this about the state of the Republican Party in October of 2008. Now, this was before the election of Barack Obama, before the GOP's eight-year-long racist primal scream in reaction to Obama. It was before birtherism, 
before death panels, and long before Donald Trump. This was 2008, back in the good old days, when everything was great, and we should all aspire to return to those good old days. Quote, As long as the monster worked on your behalf, as long as it was only gypsies and malcontents and misfits and queers and Jews and commies against whom the propaganda machine ranted by day and for whom the jackboots came by night, as long as the bell never tolled for thee, everything was just fucking peaches and cream. As long as it's just those people, good Germans like Ms. Parker will always be more than happy to make a little bank firing up the mob, only too willing to smirk and sneer and turn a little profit raging up the pig people in the service of demonizing anyone who doubts the infinite wisdom of the dear leader or the infinite goodness of the Christopath cabal that run the GOP, because it all sounds just like sweet, sweet music, just as long as it's being directed at the dirty liberals. But now the monster has turned on its creator, and good German Kathleen has finally heard an inkling of the baying, shrieking hordes whose bloody-mindedness we on the left have been trying to curb for the last generation. So, as a newly displaced pundit stranded in liberal Casablanca, let me save you some time and trouble by telling you what won't work. For about the last 30 years, we on the left tried the sweet reason thing. Didn't work at all. We tried the compromise thing. We got called weak and cowardly for our trouble. We tried, hey, let's elect the most centrist president we can find, a republican light Southerner, That'll give the Republican right almost everything they ever wanted. He'll give them welfare reform and NAFTA and DOMA and GATT and a balanced budget and surpluses and a bunch of jobs and a military victory. We tried all that. And for our sins, for our sins, we got eight years of partisan hearings, government shutdowns, slander and impeachment. Because while conservatism might have been a movement once upon a time, too many of us failed to realize until it was too late that today's conservatism is a moral dumpster fire. That was me using the word dumpster fire in 2008 of bigots, fundies, homophobes, and imbeciles. It is a disease that took over the country by screaming that everyone who disagreed with it was a God-hating traitor. And if you expect one iota of pity from anyone on this side of the moral universe for finally getting bitten by the mad dog you've been feeding all these years, you can go fuck yourself with a steam hammer. Once the disease is eradicated, we'll get back to playing nice. But until then, Anna Karenina, your locomotive is waiting, unquote. That's very shrill, Driftglass. Very, very shrill. Very shrill. I should put it in a book, jump it You'll forward. never be on Meet the Press. No. But if <laughs> I jump it ahead, I don't know, 15 years, maybe I can pass myself off as Rick Wilson. And then it's, <laughs> then it'll, be, it'll be wise, edgy. Only you could see such a thing, Rick. You're so brilliant. How did Honestly. you see in 2006, how did you know that the Republican Party was this bad? Rick, here's a book contract. What? How many? How much riches can we throw at you, Rick? You're so fucking smart. Anyway. It is amazing that by 2008, which is 15 years ago, yep. it was already too late to save the Republican base from itself and to save the Republican Party from its base. But it was not too late to continue making money. No. Being a consultant and getting assholes elected. Right. And that's what all of your never Trump heroes were doing during this time when Absolutely. all of us on the left could see the threat. They were busy making a large amount of money getting the worst people in the world elected and yep. creating the road that led to Donald Trump. Yeah. And the minds of the Republican base had fully become Team B. You know, that lack of evidence, that's proof, Drift Glass. Because mm-hmm. facts don't matter anymore. Instead, Republican base voters glom onto the lies their media and their politicians feed them because they reinforced the lies they had already absorbed about the liberal intentions and goals and conspiracies. And whenever one lie falls apart, it's replaced with another lie or Mm -hmm. it's propped back up by blaming Soros funded liberal media, because that's how deep the liberal conspiracy goes drift glass. Mm -hmm. Or if you manage to finally Back a conservative into some corner from which there was no escape. They just shrug and say the magic words, which had been taught to them by the respectable media. You know, both sides are equally bad, Drift Glass. It really is both sides, Blue Gal. It really is just both sides. And then they go right back to listening to hate radio all day and watching Fox News all night. And I want to get just a little deeper into this because QAnon is like the ultimate 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's just end game of this. Whatever I feel is true. Whatever I feel is true. I feel that Democrats are drinking baby blood. Right. Must be true. Must be true. Uh, You know, if if it's not taking away my guns, it's taking away my gas stove. Right. Bastards. The bastards. Uh, We there are two militaries. Mm hmm. You know, one of them is loyal to Trump, and that's Trump is pres- still president, and JFK Jr. is coming back, and he's going to be mm-hmm. uh, president mm-hmm. with his dad. And we're we're down at Daily pra- Plaza waiting for them to drive by, right? That's right. Wave, wave to the nice man as he goes by. He's he's the and that he, short, hairy, uh, ethnic-looking guy who we are sure is JFK Jr. Because mm-hmm. he wears a T-shirt, and will you can pay him to get a picture taken with him? Uh, yeah. I mean, all of this is Team B thinking. It, I feel like Cheney and Rumsfeld and so forth had a financial interest. Yes. In simply, you know, Rumsfeld, all these guys, just yeah, financial interest in making sure their military industrial complex people, their the stocks will keep going up and we will keep having military spending. That, well, that was that, their goal. The right? point of the, the point of the Galbraith quote was a superior moral justification for. Greed. Greed. Yeah. Yeah. It was simple yeah. that we want to make a lot of money and we need to find a reason for selfishness and greed that is morally defensible. So we invented yeah. this whole weird Reaganite infrastructure of government's bad, uh, supply side economics, yep. Laffer curve, tax yep. cuts for billionaires. And all of that was justified by freedom and freedom from regulation and freedom of your yep. soul and blah, 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 blah. But now and in he- the age of, of Citizens United, all the dollar signs are coming from fundraising from stupid billionaires and the stupid base. Yeah. And so telling them that their enemy is, you know, out to get them and you have to send $5 or even just $1 mm-hmm. to Donald Trump's defense fund, which is his political action committee. Mm-hmm. And Marjorie Taylor Greene's political action committee can buy her a $92,000 SUV. Mm-hmm. And shrug for with no consequences. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just allowed now, and and I feel like we're we're going through that robber baron era again. The Gilded Age, yep. The Gilded Age, yep. Only with political action committees and text fundraising messages. You know, mm-hmm. send five dollars or you're a Democrat is one of the things that Trump did. You know. Yeah. We're going to put you on the list of Democrats if you don't fund if you don't send us money soon. We've noticed you haven't been in communication with us recently. Are you disloyal now? Don't you aren't you a loyal member <laughs> are, of the Have you become a Biden Democrat now? Yeah. Yes. But yeah. this is all this is all the poison fruit of seeds that have been planted and carefully right. carefully husbanded for decades. Right. This is all the result of a thing. This is not the thing. This right. is the end result of a thing. And yeah. one thing you're not supposed to talk about in the mainstream media or on your Never Trump podcast or anywhere mm-hmm. but here, really, is how we got to the place where making shit up out of whole cloth, declaring mm-hmm. it to be true, putting some asshole in a suit on Newsmax to nod his head and say, yep, sounds like, sounds right to me, Phil. And that turning into an, uh, something you can impeach Joe Biden over. Mm-hmm. That whole long process is the process that nobody who participated in it or made money from it wants to talk about. They just want to talk about suddenly and spontaneously the GOP base lost its mind and believes crazy shit and who could have figured and what are we going to do? And by the way, the dysfunction in the House of Representatives is is the Republican Party can't elect a speaker because Democrats won't cooperate. It's the Democrats' fault who did it. It must be the Democrats because the only thing you're not allowed to consider if you're on the right in the House, is making any alliances or overtures to Democrats. We are the devil. Just ask Liz Cheney. Yeah. We're baby-killing monsters. We are, quote-unquote, pure evil. That's yeah. what the responsible Republicans were saying about yeah. us but Drift three Glass, years ago. On the other ago. hand, Drift Glass, mm-hmm. on the other hand, there are some great people at Fox. I, I heard, I've heard that story. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that enabling... Of Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes to have a a significant toehold in the New York City. And don't forget, they put Fox headquarters in Manhattan. Yes, they did. For a reason. To buy legitimacy and have this dangle this hiring opportunity all the time to people who had, you know, a 
Park Slope Mortgage mm -hmm. in the media. So that, well, we can't say too much about Fox. I might need to work there someday. Right. Well, and they would hire basically defunct, respectable media people. Bill right. Riley had a real media job. And Brick Hume yep. had a real media job. And Tony Snow yep. had a real media job. They would hire these people who were at the, you know, the ass end of their careers mm -hmm. and and squeeze the last drops of respectability out of them. Right. You know, because, oh, well, I know who Brick Hume is. I he used to read the weather and the news and, and when I was 12 years old, he's right. And they would steal respectability from these people to hype the crazy shit they were selling to the base. Yep. And then the problem with that is that it's never enough. Reality always catches up with the crazy nonsense and it always falls apart. And you can either say, we fucked up. We were wrong. We were wrong. We're not going to do that again. This doesn't work. Or you, you go deeper. You go deeper You double and deeper. down and you wind up violent. That's what happens. Yes, you do. You wind up with death threats to congressional spouses. Well, and you wind up shooting up a pizza joint because yep, yep. I heard somewhere that something happened and I feel I have it's to protect true. the children and, in the and, basement that doesn't exactly. exist. And yes. and my entire media ecosystem that I'm saturated in because I'm too lazy to change the fucking channel yeah. is telling me that whatever I feel is true is true. And mm -hmm. Democrats are devils and anything is acceptable to stop the demons from coming back and taking over our beautiful country and destroying it. You know, uh, January 6th was anti Fadra flag. It was. I don't know Everyone if you know that. that. I feel it. Well, it, it was a combo Black Lives Matter, FBI, <laughs> Antifa, PSYOP operation. <laughs> and because, oh, we weren't to blame? Good. And and you could hear people like, on the one hand, saying January 6th was justified. Yeah. And legitimate and patriarch. Ashley on the other Babbitt hand, died for our sins. Yes, and on the other right. hand, it was Antifa. And yeah. And you can you can see as if it's a tr an, an ant colony, an ant yep. farm. You can see the inside of their brains just melting down because they have no longer any attachment to reality because right. they've been taught over and over again that whatever the hell you feel about those devil Democrats is probably true. And you should probably do something about it, like, you know, electing Donald Trump. Right. Right. Thank you for listening. Don't forget, we really need more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can spare five bucks, please spare five bucks mm -hmm. and visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash pro left pod. And thank you for that. I believe we're going to get several thousand uh, new people on this podcast in this episode, each giving us hundreds of dollars. Oh, you, know you believe that, huh? I feel it's true. <laughs> therefore, it must be true. We'll see you next time. Bye. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.